Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And I'm down at Will Sherman's Forge because he has made me this fantastic sheaf of arrows. I use this for reenacting when I'm showing and demonstrating people what things are. And it allows us now the opportunity to talk our way through it. So the first thing is, just tell us about the actual all of the arrows, basically. Uh, so these arrows were made for your bow, which is like 80, 80, 90 pounds. So we've got a 10 millimeter arrow, ash arrow shaft with a eight or nine mil knock at the end. Piece of tapered cow horn or buffalo horn on these ones mm -hmm. in the knock. Uh, swan feathers and the glue is an animal fat, beeswax and green verdigris, copper verdigris glue. And the, the glue itself I find really interesting because we're not quite sure if it's the antibacterial, antimicrobial aspects of copper that it's there, it just preserves the feathers longer, yep. or if it's just pretty. Yeah, we've, we know they use red, we know they use green, we've got artwork showing that, we've got existing ones showing that, uh, we don't really know why yet. All right, first up, we have a Type 7 needle bogging. Now, first of all, I'll say is that we refer to these as a type. Now, this is Type 7, Type 9's are different, Type 10's different, and so on. That way, when people are talking about arrows, you're not just going, oh, it's a metal pointy thing on the end. It allows you to define one type from another. You know what the sort of the basic parameters are. Yeah. From my trials on it, I know it's really good against fabric. Yep. It's really good against shields, mail. Yep. Obviously, it's going to be good against flesh. Yep. Armor? Terrible. So plate armor, it will bend. And we've got a record actually from the medieval period saying they bend like a pig's tail. Right. So up against something flat and hard, it's just gonna curl up. Yeah, yeah. There's no strength here for it to actually go through. And like a lot of arrowheads, these were sometimes made of iron, yep. sometimes made of steel. Yep. So there are quite a few in the archeological record which are steel, but still not really gonna be strong enough. It just doesn't have, it doesn't have the bulk behind it to penetrate without damage. Yeah. So if you think of a cold chisel, for instance, where you're hammering through other bits of steel, the cutting edge on it is really quite steep. It's not fine like a wood chisel. This is kind of like the wood chisel. Yeah. It's not the cold chisel. It will not go through plate armour. Other forms of armour, it will. Yeah, and if you make them out of steel, you can put sharper edges on them and have a harder edge mm -hmm. so they can cut through things better. Yeah, the steel in there allowing you to get it really sharp. Yep. And interestingly as well, if you keep them clean and polished. Um, and then, of course, I did those trials where I waxed the heads. Yep. And if you wax the heads, they penetrate much better. How old are they, hmm. this form? Okay, so the Type 7 that we know of has got a diamond section. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite wide and flat. It's not a square. But when you go way back into the Viking period, and actually before that, uh, it's a square section. Right. So they haven't developed that diamond, which is a more efficient cutting tool. Uh, in Waterford in Ireland, we've got records from around 1170 of a much shorter arrow. It's a military arrow, but it's way, way shorter and smaller. And they've got a Type 7 on there with a square or very slightly diamond section head on that. So they're so, being used way, way before the medieval period. Fine. So if we say that they go back as far as, say, the Battle of Hastings as a convenient... Oh, way before that, day. yeah. Oh, yeah. right, fine. Way before that. Great. Now, another arrow which is closely related to that is this one, which is called, handily, the Type 9, or a short bodkin. So the Type 7 is a long bodkin, bodkin being needle. This is short, short and fat and strong. Yeah. So again, there's so much uncertainty in this. We believe that these are against plate armor and they seem to cut plate armor a bit. So we did lots of trials together on Arrows versus Armor 1 and 2, all of those films. They can go through seal, yep. but in essence, very few of those shots really penetrated the plate armor. So I think if they are against plate armor, they're for very marginal gains. It yeah. is not a given that these go through. But they do go through mail yep. and gambeson. Yeah. So if you're gonna be shooting against somebody wearing mail and gambeson and plate, so you are just stacking the odds in your favor by making it shorter and harder and more rigid, yeah. which is what they may have been used for. So. What I would say as well is a modern terminology for this, a modern name is a plate cutter. Yeah. And actually, we do not have the definitive proof that that is what this was for. It's a great name and it's caught on, but it's not actually necessarily correct. So it could well be that an old medieval name for this was the duckbill head. Yeah. Because that's used a lot, but we don't actually know what, what a duckbill head was. Yeah. So next up, we've got these two Type 16s. So the one on your right-hand side is what's called swept, where the barbs go out. 
And the other one is what's called closed, uh, although it's not very closed, this one, but uh, where the barbs come closer in towards the shank. Military heads. For sure. So military arrowheads developed from the hunting head, in particular that one, mm. the, the swept out one, was a, a tightening up of that great big wide swallowtail hunting head. You make them narrower, they're going to go through more things, they're more aerodynamic. So for me, the curious difference, I'll show you again actually, between the swept one and the closed one, is that one is going to, the swept one is going to require more force to go through armoured targets. And that's probably why they began to sweep them in. That's my guess, because obviously the barbs, the bigger the barbs poke out, the better from an anti-flesh point of view, but the harder it is to get it to go through things. Yeah. So I think that's why they're beginning to close them up. Yeah. Don't really know. But what is really intriguing, if we look back at, at these two here, the Type 7 and the 9, these were against armour. Yep. Both of them in the archaeological record, there is some evidence of them being steel, but not that much. Far more of them are made of soft iron. Yep. However, what we have quite a lot of evidence for on these ones, which are presumably, presumably against soft flesh targets, the barbs are very often of steel. Yeah, iron socket and then steel barb. Some of them are heat treated and mm. hardened. Some of them are made of steel, but not hardened. But almost all of them have got steel barbs and an iron socket. Which is a really interesting point, because if these are against flesh, why, need, why use steel. the steel in there? There's no need for it. So there is something that we are definitely missing about these. And I, for one, want to go back and do some trials yeah, against armour using these because they're not thought of as arm-piercing heads. Why the steel? Yeah. Hi, I've interrupted the film for another Todd Cutler-related interesting fact. And today, we have the antenna dagger. It goes from the 11th through to the 14th century. The first picture of something very similar to this I know of is 1080 from an Italian church wall. But it's a popular dagger all the way through to the 14th, and I love them. Anyway, you'll find this and other similar daggers available at toddcutler.com. But now, Back to the film. So next up, we have a Type 15 hunting head. It's uh, commonly known as a swallowtail these days. Interestingly, it is also the mark of all the British Army goods. So anything that belongs to the army is marked with a swallowtail mark because of the old archery days, I suppose. Massive. Yeah, they're huge. They're, they're hunting heads. They're not military. They may have taken them to war, but they're definitely a hunting mm. head, yeah. And big because you want a big wound channel, beast to, to, to bleed out fast. Now. My understanding of these is that when they're shot in, they go into the chest cavity if you're a good shot. The muscles here on the outside of the wall, you know, the beast will run a little bit. That moves about. But this, they're always blunted on the back, aren't they? They're never yeah. sharp. They don't want to come back out. No. They want to stay where they are or walk forward. And so my understanding is as the, the muscle movement goes, it catches and walks its way forward, cutting deeper. Yeah. Hunters out there tell me if I'm talking complete tripe, but that's my understanding of it. The other thing that's really interesting is they've got a massive cross-sectional area right at the front, and it's these, the feathers, that are supposed to be steering it, yep. not steering from the front, because that causes all sorts of problems. It does. So you can't shoot them from a long distance at a small target, like a heart. You they're, have to be up very close. They're, ju they're just not accurate. They steer themselves. Even with really big feathers. And these have got bigger feathers than normal? These have got bigger feathers than the military arrows. Uh, in an attempt to try and get this to steer properly. Yeah. But the bigger the feather, the louder the arrow. Right. So you're making a lot of noise. Um, the an animal can hear it from a long way away and it's got time to move around. So yeah. you want to be up close, as shown in artwork. Yeah. So if you look at the works of Gaston Fabers, who was writing, um, illustrating, uh, end of the 14th century, early 15th century, hunting is done really, really close in this period. And I don't think it's artistic convention where they're trying to squash everything into a small picture. I really believe it was that way because I've shot them off a crossbow bolt, big heads like this, and over like a 10 metre distance, you can see them do this. And I, I'm not making that up. They, they really do. And you, you have to shoot smaller heads off a crossbow bolt because it's inherently less stable than an arrow. But still, they steer themselves. Yep. So it's got to be done up close. So next up, we've got a Type 6 forked head. I made a film about this a few years ago called Six Medieval Arrowheads, and I talked my way through it. The last one I did was this one, and I said, actually, I've got no idea really what it's for. Uh, nobody does, all sorts of ideas. So should we start with what it is absolutely 
not for. It's not for shooting horse tendons. It's not for shooting ropes. It may have been used in a naval context, but it's not designed for that. Yeah. What we do know is that it's one of the oldest heads ever made, ever found. Yeah, this form of head goes back into the Stone Age, through the Roman period, and actually into the modern day now. You can get these in stone, you get them in bronze, you get them all over the world. Yeah. Every culture in the world seems to have them. So whether it be South America, China, Inuit, I don't know actually about the Aborigines. No, nor do I, but I know that the Vikings used them a lot. Yeah. Okay, so maybe almost every culture in the world, but basically you find them all over the planet and all over the timeline as well. So yeah. going back thousands upon thousands of years, right to the modern day, and they have a purpose. We know what it is, which is bird hunting. Or small game. Small game too? Yeah. Oh. Fur and feathers, it'll grab the feathers and the fur and take the yeah. animal out without destroying the meat you're trying to preserve. There's a lovely adaptation of this that I made a film on a few years ago, and it's of an arrow that was from way up in Lapland. But again, I think other cultures use it. Forked head, and then a sort of a swollen, um, almost cigar-shaped wooden uh, piece behind it. And they bounce. They're bouncing arrows. So you shoot them low over the water, and they skip. And they're, they're great for birds that land on the water, ducks and things like that. But the other thing about them is the forked head, it's the same on grass, yep. it doesn't dig in, yep. and it doesn't shoot itself into the reeds at the edge of the water. So you can go and recover your arrows afterwards, even if you miss the birds. We've all lost arrows shooting anything other than like a plate test, for example. You're shooting roving, uh, flight shooting, mm. whatever. They just go into the ground and they're gone. Yeah. These ones go in and they stand up yeah. and you've got your arrow back. But anyway, really interesting head and one that's sort of underrepresented really when, when you go out with the sort of the show and tell things. So next up, we have this one here with a wooden blunt on it. So the obvious thing, Will, is what? Hunting. Hunting. Yep, I fully agree with that. There's another intriguing possibility, we'll come to that. But this hunting, it, uh, it shares something similar with that last point that we saw, the forked one. And that is that these don't penetrate into the ground, so they lie on the surface. The other thing is that it's a very low cost head. So, you know, in comparison, because that's a bodger in the woods, isn't yep. it? Less skilled, less material cost yep. than an iron or a steel head. And they shoot really well. They're so lovely, yeah. in your trials, how have you done with them? We shot one of these. In fact, it may have been an identical head to that made by Phil Gregson, comparing it to a Type 16 head of the same weight, they go the same distance, right. more or less. So it does mean that, especially at sort of close hunting ranges, it'll make no difference at all. Now, the thing is, it's cheaper. If you lose it, it doesn't matter so much. Bird hunting and things in the woodlands and stuff like that, you're going to lose a lot of arrows. Yeah. So you're already saving your money by not using metal heads. The other thing is they don't stick in the wooden, uh, in the branches. Yep. So you don't have to climb trees to recover your arrows. They fall out. So there's lots of reasons you would want them. Small bird, you know, that coming in is just going to cave its chest in anyway. Yep. So lots of reasons for using those. But the other thing that I find really intriguing about it is uh, there's a guy called Pud, I know him as Pud, but Mark Wheatley, Mark Wheatley yeah. real name. And he came up with a theory, uh, hypothesis, I suppose it is, that this was what was used for training at the butts. Because under British law, English law, you had to shoot every Sunday at the butts. The main reason he says that is that arrowheads are very rarely found at the butts. And they should be everywhere because... Tens of thousands of people will be practicing across the time period. They should, there should be millions of arrowheads yeah. in town like centres and things. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, my village, I know exactly where the butts is in my village. It should be littered with hundreds of years worth of arrowheads yeah. because you break them, you lose them. They're not there. Yeah. And if they're not there, you kind of have to conclude that they weren't using them. Yeah. If they weren't using them, what were they using? Well, might well have been these. You see it in things like the lateral salter, yeah. you know, where they are shooting at a target and they've got these great big bulbous heads on the end. Other artwork too but you don't seem to find metal heads on the butts. Whereas with these, of course, when they're in the ground for more than a few years, they're gone. Yeah. So next up, we have an M3 Tudor or Towton Bodkin. But I'm going to start with Will here because... They're not Tudor. They're way earlier than that. And they... earlier than Towton, which was... Yeah, 1461. 1460? These go back into the 1300s, they were fine. Right. Dated to that. So actually, they're called Tudor and Towton arrowheads, and that is completely wrong. Yeah. These are a really interesting head because these are a development of the Type 16. Oh, uh, hold on. On the right hand side you have a uh, sweat Type 16 and on the left hand side you have an M3. So they don't look very similar. 
But what you've got is essentially the same process to make them. You've got mm -hmm. a socket with barbs welded or brazed on. It's the same with this head here. You can make them in one piece, you can make them in two pieces, depending on what you want the end result to be. They're too light really to be used against plates, but mm -hmm. they're very fast, they're great for long distance. And if you bring the barbs out slightly, they're going to cause the same horrendous wounds as the Type 16. Yeah. I will just caveat what Will said is we think they're too light to be used against plates. We should test it. We need to test that. And that will, that will come in due course, but we'll do that. But these intrigue me a little bit because the head is much smaller and lighter, which makes for a, a faster arrow. Faster means it's going to go further. One has to assume that the less weight means that it's going to be less good against armour. So you got theory of what's going on here? Why have they developed them like this? I mean, really, what is the point? I think they're like a multi-purpose head. They're designed for anyone who's coming at you wearing all kinds of different things. We know that the Type 9 doesn't go through plate all the time, mm. but it'll go through mail, it'll go through gambas and that kind of thing. These are very similar. These are essentially a four-sided cutting head, but you can control the tip angle, you can control the barb width, that kind of thing, and they're quite easy to make. So maybe they're just a fast, multi-purpose military head. They've sort of been optimised for kind of good at everything, yeah. but not great at anything. They're the jack-of-all-trades arrowhead, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. And you can, a, a really skilled arrowsmith can fire weld the barbs on and make them have an iron socket and steel barbs. You can get a less skilled person to braise the barbs on. There's loads of those found at Towton. Mm. Or you can make them in one piece. Easy enough to make? Very easy to make, yeah. So last up, we have some incendiary heads. These ones here. Now I'm going to put the basket down. We'll talk about that in a minute because that's quite different. So we've got these two here. One's got a flattened shank, one's got a twisted shank. Small barbs on the end. Nothing really big. The idea with these is that they go in, they're hard to draw out, that's what the barbs are about. They're not against flesh, they're not about armour penetration, they're not about hunting. These are not circular, the shanks are not circular. The idea is that you compact your compound around it, you wrap it, you do all sorts of other bits. We are going to do a film on this, it's just too good to leave alone. <laughs> We're coming back for a big one, not yet. And we have existing ones where the compound is wrapped around it, it's lit, it's shot. You've got some with the compound still on, haven't we? Yes, yes we do. So we know exactly what they, these are and what they were. They go back into at least the 14th century, possibly before, and they're still getting shot from muskets, certainly by the time of the English Civil War, so 1650s, they're still getting shot arrows just like this out of muskets. So those we know what they are. So now we're going to come back to this fire basket, as it's called. Now, this is really where I want you to educate me because, <laughs> uh, and will actually, uh, because I don't know of any of these in the artwork. I know of a very few in the archaeological record. I can only actually put my pic uh, finger on a picture of one. Which is European, not English. European, not English. There you go. Now, the idea behind them, apparently, is that you put hot coals in them, you wrap them with a bit of burning stuff, whatever. But my problem with this, and again, we're going to come back to test this, is that that is, if that hits on something like a wooden structure, the whole thing is going to collapse. Yep. Any embers that you've got in there are just going to fall on the ground or wherever it is. It is a really inefficient way of delivering fire. Might kind of work against thatch. Yeah. Uh, but not massively exciting. It's a lot of work to go through for something that may not work particularly well. Yeah. They're very hard to make those things. Are they? Yeah. Okay. So I have one other theory, which again I will test, is they certainly weren't shy of chemical warfare in the medieval period. It's not something we think about very much, but they did do it. So uh, they certainly had clay pots where they put lime powder in and throw them uh, on ships and at sieges and things like that. I wonder if you could put lime powder in this and the cloth around it, and then actually it's collapsing nature is perfect for the delivery of that, that it hits on some walls or whatever. Big puff of lime. Lime, um, Basically, it's a caustic agent that will burn any wet membranes, eyes, throats, nose. Was it a liming arrow, he says in inverted commas, hmm. or was it a fire arrow? I don't know. Opinions, please, because that's one that I'd really like to know about. So that's our walkthrough of most of the standard medieval arrowheads. Uh, there are lots of other ones out there, lots of different varieties and variations and forms and changes of form, depending on who's making them when they're being hmm. made. There are other military heads that aren't in here but these are the basic developments of each type. Okay. Well, Will, thank you very much for that walkthrough. No worries. Thank you very much for watching if you made it to the end. And, uh, well, we'll see you again. Cheers. Cheers.